This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 88th edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. And I have a very fascinating guest today, Jackie McCormick. Jackie's a former college basketball player, and she's the director of Rise Above. And Jackie, your first name is spelled J-A-C-I. And I'm sure people call you J.C. sometimes. Is that correct? My entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm off to a good. Yeah, we got a little, we got a little creative with the spelling there. Absolutely, I like it. So we got off to a good start. That I know your first name is pronounced Jackie, because I, I would feel like a real jerk if I bungled your first name. So my sports and stuff show has been around now since 2017, having a lot of fun. Most of my shows now are up on YouTube and Rumble. Many are on my website, and my shows also run on Rainier Avenue Radio World. Uh, I want to get back to you, Jackie. So I'm going to do a little quick introduction, and I'm going to fire off a whole bunch of questions. So Jackie, um, Jackie McCormick's been involved in the Native American community. She grew up on the Nez Perce Reservation near Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, Jackie, I believe you currently work uh, as a as victim assistance coordinator for the Tulalip Tribe Prosecutor's Office? Yeah, so um, I've been here for about five years and do outreach with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, but um, really expanding outside of that and trying to serve victims of all crimes. Important work, very important work. Jackie, as I mentioned above, is also the director of the Rise Above organization, which we're definitely going to talk about this interview. Jackie played college basketball at Illinois State University. Jackie has a fasting life story. And Jackie, I read that at some point this year, a major motion picture is going to come out about your life. Yeah, we've been, you know, we've been, we've been working on this for about three years and it's, it's, you know, it's been a grind and we're, we're excited to keep the ball rolling and yeah, it's, it's, it'll be a good, it'll be a good experience for something to come out for, um, rise above and the story and hopefully create some some impact on um, Indian country. Well, I really appreciate you coming on sports and stuff, by the way. So we're going to have fun today. Hey, Jackie. So um, I want to ask you about something. It's, it's a major news story right now. I believe it's going on in Washington, D.C. this morning. And you are of Native American descent. And you obviously have an interest in Native American community. Deborah Haslund has been nominated to be the Secretary of the Interior. And if confirmed, Haslund will be the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary in U.S. history. It looks like her confirmation will probably go through, although there's a procedural floor debate going on now. Um, what does it mean to you and the Native American community, um, this Haslund uh, nomination? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I talk about this all the time is, you know, representation matters. We, we talk about this all the time of, you know, seeing seeing people who look like us and are from our community and who we can relate to, it, it really has an impact not only on adults, but the way kids dream and believe in, in, the, in their aspirations um, are increased by seeing people in those positions. So I think it's, I, I think it's great whenever, you know, we have representation at any level, you know, I have a great relationship with um, Deborah Juarez on the Seattle city council. And I tell her that all the time is that representation matters and, She's impacted a lot of Native folks in our state and in our region also by what she's doing on, on her platform. So I, I think it's a win for um, for Indian country. Yeah, it really is. It's just It just blows me away that in American history, there's never been a U.S. cabinet member of Native American descent. I, it, it just kind of blows me away. Does it still kind of blow you away? It will probably be not until 2021 that a Native American person's been in a U.S. cabinet. Yeah, it's it, it's wild. Um, and, and actually, we talked about this with um, Councilmember Juarez that she's the first uh, American Indian to sit on the Seattle City Council, and which is kind of mind blowing, also because we have forty three tribes in Washington State. So it, it's just it, it it's a, it's been a long time coming, and and we were really looking forward. And that, um, you know, I've watched. I've actually met Deb Holland. Um, you know, years, like three years ago, I think when she was first getting into her um, political role and she just, one of the first things that she told me, I just wanted to, you know, meet her and say that I met her and she just said, run for office, whatever you're doing, just run. Like, if you don't think you're qualified, just run anyway and see what the experience brings to you. And um, she was just very encouraging and, and it was awesome. Anyhow, I'll, we'll move on from the subject in a minute, but uh, Deborah Haslin, I guess, will end up being kind of like a Jackie Robinson of the Native American community. As we know, Jackie Robinson, who 
as your first name was the first African American in baseball. So she she's uh she's definitely a historical breakthrough figure in many ways, assuming she gets confirmed. Absolutely. Hey, I got a little fun, interesting fact for you that that just blew me away. Did you know that Kamala Harris is, although she's the first female vice president, did you know she's not the first person of color to be vice president of the United States? Um, no, I did not know that. Well, here's who it is. The first vice president of color is Charles Curtis, who is Hubert Hoover's vice president. He was Native American, three-eighths Native American. On his mother's side, he was a descendant of Chief White Plume of the Cod Nation and Chief Pauska of the Osage, I believe. So did you know that there has actually been a Native American vice president of the United States of America? I was not aware of that, no. That's a little interesting factoid. I learned that late in the 2020 election, so I had to share that with you, Jackie. Yeah, that's awesome. I will, I will definitely have to look that up. For sure. Jackie, in our couple of our communications before the show started, and it's been fun to get to know you a bit, you communicated to me that sports has provided a platform for a lot of stuff in your life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, I I went to college at Illinois State, and um, that really, honestly, that really paved the way. But even prior to going to Illinois State, I played basketball growing up on the reservation and it was it was with basketball where I found really I found peace I found who I was and it just brought me a lot of comfort and so that I just I just stuck with it so basketball has really taken me from Lapway to Lake Oswego in Oregon from Lake Oswego to Illinois State and just created a lot of additional opportunities being passionate about basketball and doing something that I love so um it's, it's been awesome and and that's really where Res Above kind of, you know, took that. And we meet people where they're at, where, where they're passionate about using sports really as a modality to impact and create more opportunities for other people. So um, st- sports has just been the gateway for me. Absolutely. What was it like growing up, Jackie, on the Nez Perce Reservation near Lewiston, Idaho? You know, it, it was a great experience. So, I, you know, living in Lapway, it's a, it's a very small town. Um, I think when I was growing up, it was like 1,100 people and no, no, uh, no lights. We only had stop signs, so no street lights or, or um, the stop lights, um, only stop signs. And one of the cool things about growing up in Lapway is really the tight knit community. You know, you really have so much support and so much family, and um, it, it's just really a great experience. But it also creates this like you're so close knit and you know, you have so much support where leaving your community makes it difficult because that's not, that's not what happens when you leave. That's not what happened when I went to Lake Oswego, you know, it was, it was very hard and it was a very hard adjustment for me, but um, you know, that close knit community and that family atmosphere is, is really something to, something to be in. That must have been a real transition in your life, Jackie, going from the Nez Perce Reservation to an upper-middle-class, upper-class uh, Portland suburb of Lake Oswego. Oh, man, it was <laughs> it, it was probably the hardest transition of my entire life. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone through a lot, I've been through a lot, and I've experienced a lot, but trans, transferring from Lapway, where it's, you know, almost 90% American Indian, kids who look like me, grew up like me, had the family like me, and going into Lake Oswego, where I'm one of a handful of kids <laughs> that are people of color and very upper class, and I just didn't fit in in any in any way. Um, and it was by far one of the hardest um, transitions for me. And, and I struggled academically, socially, athletically. Um, but again, basketball is where I found my peace. Did, did you feel by the time you left high school in Lake Oswego, did you feel more at peace with that experience living in Lake Oswego in some ways? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I always say that, you know, I wouldn't have made it at college, especially at Illinois State, where it's, you know, 2,000 miles away from home, had I not went through the journey of going to Lake Oswego and really, you know, building that resiliency and building that foundation to leave. And, you know, Lake Oswego was a great experience for me and, you know, my high school coach, we're still great friends today, um, Coach Lavender, and 
it, it was it was a great experience and definitely molded me and built my resiliency to make it to the next level for sure. This is Paul Schneiderman of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Ready with Jackie McCormick, the president of the Rise Above uh, organization. We're having a very interesting, fun conversation. Jackie, I want to ask you something about the concept of Native Americans living on reservations, and I want to get your feedback on this. There's some people out there, including some in the Native American community, who aren't the biggest fans of the whole concept of Native Americans living on reservations in, in modern day America. Can you give us some thoughts on that? Are you do you, do you believe very much in the concept of of reservations? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, my opinion definitely does not reflect anybody else's opinion. But you know, we we were moved to you know our reservation in Lapway, and and that's all I knew. And you know, you learn about the history of of how we were placed. Um, you know, how we moved from our own homeland and placed in these small reservations. But, you know, we've really, I, I personally have, you know, adjusted to that. I've, I've grown from that. You know, one of my big things is, you know, I really can't change what happened. I can only change looking forward and, and really embracing where I grew up and my tribe and my heritage. Um, it's always just looking forward. It's, it's, it's not looking back. And I think that, you know, we are expanding We're, you know, my tribe personally is purchasing some of our land back, which is really exciting. But it's also you look at it and we're like, OK, we're buying land that we already own um, back. But but it is really special to the tribe, um, you know, to have those opportunities and, and, and to really expand and um, get back to our original homeland. So overall, you like the concept of Native American communities maintaining these homelands. I mean, you know, some of us, you know, that's all, that's all I know, you know, that's, that's what I know. I, I, I can learn from, you know, our history and, and what's happened, but you know, uh, it's, it's really tough. I mean, it's, it's a very contentious and a lot of people have very strong beliefs on, on both sides and, you know, you just, I'm very careful with, <laughs> with what I share. So I understand. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to offend either way. Totally understand. I was just kind of curious to get your, your firsthand perspective on the whole, uh, concept of, of Native American homelands and reservations. Jackie, um, you attended Illinois State University. Can you tell us a little bit about attending Illinois State and about the basketball program there and so forth? Yeah, so I actually made it to Illinois State through um, Jenny Yop, who was previously coaching at Portland State University, um, developed a relationship with her through Coach Lavender and, you know, went 2,000 plus miles away to normal Illinois. Um, and it was, it was, again, you know, a, a culture shock for me. And, you know, there aren't any tribes that I'm aware of in Illinois. So, again, being removed, you know, not only from my family, but also um, identifying with anybody who shared, you know, my same heritage with me and just not having that. Um, it was it was a definitely a tough transition for me, but um, a great experience at Illinois State. Jackie, in your life, was it a bigger transition as a young person going from your tribe to Lake Oswego, or was it a larger transition going from Lake Oswego to Illinois State University? How, compare and contrast those transitions, if you can, in your life. Um, by far, it was leaving Lapway, going to Lake Oswego, um, because, you know, I, I when I look back in hindsight, and, you know, I've had a lot of reflection when we go through this film and, you know, meeting and um going through this film and my life story, my life journey with, with Dennis, who was, you know, helping with the, the film side of things. I was leaving as a 14 year old kid and I was leaving my entire family and everything that I knew and loved on the reservation and moving to Lake Oswego where it's very, very um, upper class. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of kids of color and it was just, it, it was very hard, and, you know, I just actually shared this experience with my mom only, like, two or three years ago. Is I remember she would be calling me and asking, you know, how's school going, how are things going, and how's the transition? And I remember, that was before cell phones, right? And so <laughs> I was on the, the landline, <laughs> but it was cordless. <laughs> so I was on the cell phone, or on the, on the home phone, and she's asking, how are things going? And I just remember, like, tears just streaming down my face. And I was like, Mom, it's great. It's so much fun. I'm, I'm learning. There's, the people are great. School is great. Everything's awesome. Um, 
because I felt like she already sacrificed enough and she didn't have to worry about me and how I was doing. So I wanted her to be at peace with my transition. And that's kind of what pushed me to make it also. Um, but being torn away, it really, you know, I say torn because it was very hard to leave my family, friends, and everything that I knew and loved behind to go to Lake Oswego. And there was just, it, it was just very, very hard. Um, I was raised by my grandparents. Um, so I moved in with my aunt and uncle in Lake Oswego, and they had two young sons at the time. And so I had some family, but it was just, it was very difficult going from, you know, walking to school like a mile, uh, I mean, a couple minutes down the road to taking public transportation and figuring out my way to the city. And uh, it was just very hard. And, you know, when I talk about that resiliency building, it was it was definitely formed at Lake Oswego in that transition. And when I went to Illinois State, I already had those tools. I already had that foundation from that transfer to Lake Oswego, where my adjustment to Illinois State, it was still difficult, no doubt. But it was nothing like my transition from Lapway to Lake Oswego. You know, Jackie, you may have been more prepared based on your experience going from the Indian Reservation to Lake Oswego as a 14-year-old girl going off to college 2,000 miles away. Because a lot of kids who never had the transition you had when they were 14, maybe adjusting to college could have been harder for them in some ways. So just food for thought on that. Do you have any, do you have any uh, take on that uh, thought? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, when I talked about leaving the reservation before, you know, when, when you're in this close-knit community, it's it's very hard to leave that. And fortunately for me, I actually had family when I left. So, it, you know, that is, I think, one of the challenges for kids going straight from the reservation, going straight to college. You, you, you lose that close-knit community, that close-knit family and friend circle, and you're on your own. So it, it is very difficult to make that transition. And I'm just fortunate that I had the family that I had um, to live with, you know, during my transition to Lake Oswego. Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with Ms. Jackie McCormick. All right, Jackie, you're the president of Rise Above. And I believe the mission of Rise Above is to help wellness on reservations through basketball. And I believe you're also involved in raising youth awareness to fight violence and drug and alcohol abuse. Can you tell us a little bit more about your specific work at Rise Above? Yeah, so Rise Above was founded in 2015. And, you know, I co-founded it with Mr. Brad Myers, who is an amazing business partner, an amazing friend of mine. Um, and really, we formed Rise Above um, to create resiliency, empower youth, and provide some education and prevention efforts just around healthy lifestyles, but really using sport as a modality. So, you know, we've partnered with some amazing folks in in Seattle, you know, sports is, you know, we had partnered with the Tulalip Tribes and um, had Michael Bennett come out and do a clinic with the Tulalip Tribes in football. We've had Gary Payton come out to the reservations in eastern Washington and we have Coach Lenny Wilkins come out and do talks. Um, and, and I've just been very fortunate and very blessed to have some amazing partners come out and support our efforts to really impact kids and, and build some resiliency and create some hope for our Native kids. What, what a wonderful job you're doing. And I want to ask you some follow-up questions in a, in a moment about some of those uh, aforementioned famous sports figures that you have worked with. But let me back up on something else here. Are these problems of violence and drug and alcohol abuse on Native American reservations necessarily worse than they are in other aspects of society? And if so, why? Um, You know, I don't know if they're worse. I think um, statistically speaking, we suffer, um, you know, from health disparities a lot higher. Um, Right. I don't know if the violence... um, you know, is any different when you're looking at, you know, inner city or groups of communities. Um, But I think it's, it's a lot harder to, it's a lot harder to deal with and overcome because you, again, you go back to those close knit communities where you're constantly seeing, you know, other families or other, you know, people that have been involved in this, um, maybe take intimate partner violence, for example, it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to like overcome and it, it just feels more, present when you're in these close-knit communities so i don't know if the rates are higher um but absolutely 
Native Americans suffer disproportionately higher rates of health inequality, for sure. That's a very good point you brought up about some of the health inequality issues that affect the Native American community and other communities as well. And by the way, your business partner, Brad Meyer, is a very good man. I know Brad a little bit. He's a real gentleman. So you, you, have, a, you have a good business partner there. Jackie, you're very passionate about basketball. How do you reach out to kids who are not that into basketball? You know, we, we talk about this uh, often. And, you know, we, we try and reach kids at, at different levels of where they're at. So when we have conversations, it's, you know, maybe 80% of the kids are playing sports or playing basketball. Well, 100% of kids are listening to music. So we're trying to find um, creative ways to really attract kids into Rise Above um, using sport, using culture, whatever we can, you know, to, to attract kids to us, you know, and that's one of the things that Rise Above, I feel like we're very, we adapt very well and we're not, trying to be uh, one we're not trying to fit one thing for every kid you know we're, we're really trying to adapt and meet kids where they're at so um, we definitely want to expand and, and create some music create some culture pieces um, into into rise above do a little tweaking and modifying if, it, if a kid if you can capture a kid with something else other than basketball then it's kind of what I'm hearing um, yeah absolutely absolutely um, real quick backup here. I just thought of something that there has been a Native American vice president of the United States, but there has not been a Native American U.S. cabinet member until maybe Haslam gets confirmed, which could be as we're speaking. So just food for thought that there, there, there was a Native American vice president before there was a Native American cabinet member. That's an interesting little twist, isn't it? Yeah, that is. I am definitely going to look that up and... Um do some research because you know I, I think it's important for for us to know um especially when you know we talk about the film a lot and how you know our native americans aren't really on mainstream media and how can we how can we start changing this how, how can we start changing that and create more opportunities for our kids to see people like them you know in these higher places and um in these different areas and being passionate about things and you know, really creating hope. Well, Jackie, the name Charles Curtis, that, that will be a name that you'll carry on after this interview with you, perhaps. <laughs> so, um, Yes, for sure. I jotted it down. There you go. There you go. So I, you know, as a big sports fan, it's just so much fun to hear some of those big names that you mentioned. And, you know, I remember Gary Payton as a player, and I met Gary a couple times, very personal guy. But Gary was very much known as a trash talker on the court. But, boy, he can sure step it up for kids, can he? Oh, he is, you know, he's done an amazing job for us and really, you know, definitely shared some of his personal experiences. And, you know, when when Gary talks, when, um, you know, he captures the entire gym, you know, parents are like, look up, like, I mean, his voice is, his presence is is very, very strong. And um, his passion that he brings to the kids is, is, is something else. Yeah, for sure. You know, what, one thing about Gary Payton, the same thing with Ken Griffey Jr., you know, growing up in Seattle and being a, a 1990s era Seattle sports fan, that, you know, Gary and Ken Griffey Jr. have their um, controversial aspects, but I had never, ever heard of those two players ever turning down like Children's Hospital or, or organizations that, that help kids and families. Yeah, and I think when um, Gary came out to, you know, one of our very first clinics, he actually connected with a family that he he was um, connected with when he played for the Sonics. So to see that kind of come full circle and after he's done playing, reconnect with his family. And the family that he connected with actually was really suffering. They had lost um, some of their family members, you know, um, some of them had died. Some of them were struggling, you know, with some addiction. But it really opened up his eyes about why Rise Above is doing what we're doing. And, and it really directly related because he had that connection with his family. And, and it kind of hit home with him. And then he really did, you know, what we were doing to his growing up in, in Oakland and um, being able to impact kids and give back. So it, it's, it's definitely been a great partnership for us, for sure. Yeah, Gary. Gary's quite a guy. Um, 
another famous athlete or sports figure that you've worked with is Lenny Wilkins. And when I think of a great diplomat or ambassador of the sport of basketball, I think of Lenny Wilkins. Would you agree with the, those sentiments? Oh, absolutely. Lenny, I, I've been so blessed just to, you know, I could sit and listen to Coach Wilkins all day, talk about his experiences and share it. Um, what a great human. I mean, we, we definitely need more people like Lenny Wilkins in the world. There's just something about Lenny, like when you meet him and say hello to him, you, you, you want to be on like the best, most proper behavior. There's just something about Lenny. He has that aura, doesn't he? Oh, for sure. You, you dev, Everyone wants to be buttoned up in front of Coach Wilkins. I mean, what a, what a great guy. And, you know, he just is, is very... Um, very sincere and very authentic and that's one thing some things that I really appreciate about coach Wilkins is you know very sincere and his authenticity uh, definitely comes through when you meet him what an iconic sports figure who, who lives in the uh, Seattle area Paul Schneider again host of sports and stuff on Rainier Avenue radio with with Jackie McCormick can you share a little bit about Craig Elo and Nate Robinson working with those two uh, gentlemen yeah, Craig actually has been a been a great um, partner for us. Also, we, you know, Brad shares a story about his relationship with Craig at Washington State and playing for Coach George Raveling. And you know, it, it's been fun to kind of see this journey of you know players coming back and um, sharing their experiences. You know, with Brad playing at Wazoo and Craig coming in, and um, you know, Craig Craig has definitely struggled. You know, he played so many years in the NBA and and struggled with back surgeries and he kind of shares his journey with the kids about how, you know, that impacted him and, and long-term and he, he struggled with, you know, he had his own struggles and he shares those with the kids. And I, I think, you know, the kids hearing from people like Craig Elo, like Nate Robinson and, and, and just talking about the struggles at every level, but also the commitment and the hard work. So it's, it's been awesome. Um, Nate Robinson came out with uh, Chris Hippa and did um, a couple of the, basketball clinics and um just great great people and you know i think that's one thing that rise above has always done is really surround ourselves with like-minded and like mission folks who want to give back and impact kids wonderful stuff i uh will continue to follow your foundation can you give me five or ten more minutes jackie yeah absolutely wonderful okay so you know women's basketball well and I, I'm going to throw out a bunch of names. I want you to pick who you think, I'm going to put you on the spot, who you think is the most impactful figure in American women's basketball. I'm just going to throw out some names. It could be somebody off the list, but let me throw out a bunch of names. Lisa Leslie, Diane Tarazi, Becky Hammond, Lauren Jackson, Cheryl Miller, Coach Pat Summit, uh, Sue Bird. Who, who, who do you think is the most impactful American women's basketball figure? Um, shoot. I, I like, you know, that's a great list. It's so hard to pick from that list. Um, Cheryl Miller, I think has paved the way she was, you know, when I was growing up watching her, um, she did some amazing things and continues to do, um, great things for our community. Um, Diana Taurasi, I think the way, you know, she's just played on the court and, um, they all bring so much and Sue Bird, her, you know, going out and, you know, really putting herself out there to create more opportunities, you know, for women, um, you know, coming out. I think that was a big deal. Um, I don't know. It's so hard to pick from that list, Paul. Um, <laughs> I told you I was going to put I you on the spot. Cheryl, Cheryl, Cheryl Miller. Cheryl Perfect. Miller. Cheryl Miller. But could a case be made for Sue Bird long time that she could be maybe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, known as the most impactful American women's basketball figure? Yeah, for sure. I mean, she's, you know, she's definitely stepped up and, you know, um, advocated for, for women, for sports and, you know, the equal equal pay with her partner, uh, Megan Rapino. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot to say about Sue Bird of putting herself out there and kind of being on the forefront of all these um, all these important issues. So for sure. Um, and, and let's not forget her, you know, her basketball accolades of, you know, winning championships and both collegiately and professionally. And, um, yeah, she's she's been amazing for Seattle, for sure. She is so much fun to watch. It's just amazing. She's about to enter her 20th year on the Seattle Storm. It's, it's, it's an incredible story. Isn't that crazy? Just can't believe it. Remember when she was a young, young woman in, like, 2002 when she started playing for the Storm? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just incredible. 
Um, okay, so I've asked this question to all sorts of guests, and we can call it the Paul Schneiderman question. Lucius is probably chuckling right now, and, and some of my few listeners, I think, are, oh gosh, Paul's going to ask this question again. But I'm going to ask, I've been asking it since like about late 2019. And here's some of the answers I've received. Uh, Dave Grosby answered Floyd Merriweather. Dave Sims, the Mariners broadcaster, answered Sandy Koufax. I had law professor Alan Dershowitz on. He said Sandy Koufax. Uh, I got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Mike Tyson. If you could have an interview or extended discussion with one living sports figure, it could be an agent, a coach, a player, an owner, who would it be? Um, Serena Williams. Love it. The great yes. tennis player. I, um, oh my gosh. I think, um, the things that Serena has done, you know, I've, I've watched her. I, I actually think that I could play tennis. So <laughs> I, I watched Serena. I watched her new documentary. Um, I'm a big fan of hers, you know, just things that, you know, I've watched her and her sister, like I've, I've read about her. Um, and the things that she's done is just amazing. I, you know, she's, won a championship while she was pregnant. I mean, there's so many things that she has done. and I, I feel like she's one of the greatest um, in women's sports. Boy, that's a great factoid that she won a championship while while pregnant. That I love that name. And, and that's the first woman on the list. So I'm really glad that to get your perspective of that question. And Serena's incredible. And I hit the tennis ball around. I'm not great, but I've been hitting around a little, actually a little more during the pandemic. And some of those great tennis players, they make it look kind of easy, but tennis is not easy. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it's definitely not. Um, but she, she inspired me to, to dust off my racket and, and try and like get back into it. So I love it. Yeah. Great name. And I, I think she's going to go down in history as one of the most influential athletes of, of the 21st century. Um, I got a couple minutes left. Paul Schneiderman of sports and stuff on Rainier Avenue radio with Jackie McCormick. Jackie, would you ever want to coach basketball at the high school, college, or pro levels? Um, I, I love more player development, I would say. I, I'm not sure that I'm made to be be a coach, um, but I love player development. I think there's, you know, you know, you, you look at high school sports, and it's just hard. My, my Actually, my younger sister is coaching in Clapway, which is a very, very <laughs> – um, hard town to coach in so I you know I watch what she goes through I watch what you know how parents are and um I, I think I would rather be more player development and help them fine-tune those skills and be a mentor than really being a coach um but I, I love I love working with kids so maybe one day but I, I would I would reserve to, to player development. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate your answer, and, and this is totally different, but you may kind of get the very loose analogy. There's a lot of attorneys in my field of work that just don't feel they want to be judges. They just think, I'd rather be an attorney than be a judge. So I guess being a coach is kind of a different paradigm, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Well, Jackie, I got a couple minutes left here. Can you tell us a bit more about the motion picture that's going to come out about your life? When's it coming out? Uh, where is it being produced? Is it going to be online? Give, give us some more info about this uh, motion picture that I know many of us, including myself, are looking forward to uh, watching. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this, this this opportunity really came out of nowhere. And Dennis Lee, who is in L.A., approached us about creating this um, story. And it was really supposed to be about Res Ball, and it turned into my life story. So, um, it's been a, it's been a journey. Right now, we actually just secured a female native writer, Erica Tremblay, and we're about to start in the script writing phase. So, the first draft of the script will be done in 12 weeks, and then we have a couple more weeks to review, and then the final draft, and another four to eight weeks. Um, and after that, we're in production. So, we're hoping to do it by this year, um, but really, it's more about creating a good a good film and less about the timing of it so maybe next year um but yeah it's, a, it's been a it's been a journey it'll hopefully create um some opportunity for kids filmmakers interested in the industry but also create the social movement for native kids and native families where they see my story and it's a part of their story and it's really not about me i mean the story is about me but it's really not about me it's really talking about how we how we move on and how we embrace change and build resiliency and empowerment and get through all these struggles of life that get thrown at you. 
What's the and title? How do we move on from that? What's the title of the movie going to be, Jackie? Well, we don't know yet. We have just kind of thrown around "Rise Above," but we we haven't really got to that point yet. Um, I'm I'm an advocate for "Rise Above," but I don't know if that'll I don't know if that'll go forward. So we'll see. We'll see. Is it going to be in the theaters, or is it going to be more of an online type of production? You, you know, it's it's this whole pandemic has created more opportunities for you know streaming. So I think it that's not been decided yet of if it's going to be in theaters or if it's going to be something that is just streamed right away you know that's 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 something above my pay grade well i'm going to demand <laughs> to i'm in, i will demand that you and brad keep me informed will you promise me oh promise for appreciate sure. appreciate by the way a really good uh w- movie about women's basketball took place at my alma mater roosevelt high school in seattle the heart of the game have you seen the heart of the game no, I haven't. I recommend it. Came out about 2007 or so. Very good movie. Very Hollywood movie based on a true story about the Roosevelt women's basketball team. So I, I, it's a really good one. Well, I can't wait to see your movie, Jackie. Well, what else is in the future for Jackie McCormick? Um, you know, building Rise Above. We're, we're working on some exciting projects. We're working with the Kalispell Tribe in Washington and creating some, um, some centers and, you know, really just... Hope, hopefully, hoping to make Rise Above a national program where Native kids can be a part of something larger than themselves and just be completely exposed to new opportunities and traveling and, you know, just just trying to make an impact on kids. And um, that's where my passion is. And, and that's, that's what I'll continue to do is be passionate about helping kids and creating more opportunities for, for youth. Great stuff, Jackie. We appreciate you coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue, Radio.World. You and I will be in touch. For sure. Thank you so much for having me. You too. Bye-bye.